like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. A warm welcome to the National University of Singapore Young Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity webinar. Thank you for joining this, I would say, special edition. Uh, today we have Professor Brian Kennedy with us, and there were lots of requests to have him on the show, and um, not as a host this time, but as a presenter. So here we are. I imagine that you will have lots of questions for uh, Professor Brian Kennedy, so please use the Q&A uh, function. And I also have an important reminder for you um, to attend our future episodes, which will be brilliant, I would say. You will need to sign up to our webinar again as we are changing the registration platform. And you can find the link to sign up in the chat room. It's already up there. Um, but we will also send the registration link in the weekly invitations um, and also, of course, after this webinar. Now it's time before starting with the presentation of Professor uh, Brian Kennedy to hear from Luke Josef Lim. And he is a third year student at the Temasek Polytechnic. And Luke is currently with us and he is studying the accelerated lung aging in mice. So Luke, here's your floor. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is Luke, a Polytechnic intern currently interning at the Brian Kennedy Lab. Today, I'll be presenting on my major project, also known as my final year project. The title of my project is Investigation of P38 Alpha's Contribution to Accelerated Lung Aging in Mice. This project is a subset from my supervisor's project. Firstly, what is accelerated lung aging? Well, it is when pulmonary function deteriorates at an increased rate and pulmonary inflammation increases at an increased rate as compared to normal lung aging. What this means is that in some people, their lung is going through the aging process faster than usual. People at risk for this are smokers, people living in areas with air pollution, and people who are genetically susceptible. For the lung to age, the rate of lung aging depends on both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So why this project is important is if the causative factors that contribute to accelerated lung aging are identified, we will be able to help those susceptible and vulnerable to maintain their pulmonary integrity as they age. So now onto the protein of interest. What are the P38 proteins? Well, there are a class of mitogen activated protein kinases, also known as MAP kinases. They play a major role during inflammatory responses and are regulated in response to inflammatory and stress stimuli, such as cytokines, ultraviolet irradiation, osmotic shock, and heat shock. The P38 protein family is also involved in cellular processes like autophagy, apoptosis, and cell differentiation. There are four known isoforms of P38, but the one we will be looking at is the alpha isoform, known as P38-alpha. It is the isoform that is found extensively throughout the body and is involved in inflammation. One of the examples showing the pro-inflammatory role of P38 is in macrophages. The first line of defense in the body against pathogens are macrophages, and their numbers increase massively in individuals with inflammatory diseases. So, how does P38 play a role in this? Well, P38 promotes the expression of pro-inflammatory mediators in these macrophages. These mediators causes more inflammation, which leads to more macrophages being produced, leading to an increase in P38 expression, hence creating a positive feedback loop, as can be seen highlighted in the diagram on the right. 
Now, on to P38, involvement in chronic inflammatory lung diseases. Firstly, in asthma. In asthma, the activation of P38 causes transforming growth factor beta to induce apoptosis of human airway epithelial cells, which are more likely to go through apoptosis in asthmatic people. It is also implicated that P38 MAP kinases causes bronchial remodeling like the thickening of the sub-epithelial basement membrane. This means that there is a change in the number and appearance of the cells, and with this remodeling, it has been observed that there is deposition of the extracellular matrix. Next, in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, there is more cellular senescence and there is impaired repair and regeneration. Oxidative stress from cigarette smoking causes lung inflammation, and this activates P38, which is involved in the pathogenesis of COPD. What this means is that P38 plays a role in the development of COPD. As can be seen by the diagram provided from a study done, there is an increase in phosphor P38 plus cells in alveolar walls of people with COPD. This is also observed in phosphor P38 plus levels in alveolar macrophages. Altogether, this information leads us to hypothesize that P38 alpha may contribute to accelerated lung aging. So, what is the aim of this project? Well, it is to investigate the contribution of P38 alpha to accelerated lung aging in mice. In accelerated lung aging, there are multiple hallmarks, but we, are all, but we will only be looking at three hallmarks. Well, the three hallmarks of lung aging that we will be focusing on are stem cell exhaustion, cellular senescence, and extracellular matrix dysregulation. We will be looking for these three hallmarks in mice that express active P38 alpha in comparison to that of the regular mice. The mice that will express active P38 alpha is an inducible mouse model and will be fed a doxycycline diet which will activate the P38 alpha. These mice will then be compared to the control group which will be fed a regular diet. So for this project, there are three time points. The one-month time point, the three-month time point, and the six-month time point. So for how this will be carried out is after the mice are about 6 to 12 weeks old, the experiment will start. After that, experiment's time point has been reached, we would harvest the lungs for immunohistochemical and immunofluorescence staining, and also qPCR. All the results obtained would then be analyzed and then interpreted. We hope to find out what P3A alpha's contribution is to accelerated lung aging in mice. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Luke. Um, I think we are looking forward to the final results and maybe also see if other organs are also affected uh, by that molecule. But now it's my um, great pleasure to introduce Professor Brian Kennedy, and he will talk about targeting aging directly, uh, no time like the present. So I'm really looking forward to what the present time is. Um, Professor Brian Kennedy is the director of the Health Longevity Translational Research Program at the National University of Singapore, where our Center for Health Longevity is uh, embedded. And he is the um, distinguished professor in the departments of biochemistry and physiology at the Yonglu Lin School of, uh, of Medicine at NUS. And uh, before joining NUS in 2016, uh, Brian was the president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging in, in the US. And uh, he also has uh, lots of other appointments. And he is, for example, the co-editor in chief of the Journal of Aging Cell, a very nice journal, and uh, is consultant and board member of uh, a couple of uh, biotechnology companies working on longevity research, so really combining um, the private and uh, academia. And finally, um, he is an enthusiastic runner. So Brian, I hope you do not mind that I disclose that you really like to, to run. Uh, and I would like, also, of course, to hear why you're doing that, maybe to, to decrease your biological age. But um, first, over to you. I'm looking <laughs> forward to your presentation. Thanks, Andrea. And I have to say, first of all, that it's really great to have you working together with us at NUS. And it's, uh, I think we uh, complement each other nicely. And I'm saying that because I mean it and also because I want you to go, go light on me with the questions later. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I thought I would give a little bit of a talk today, which is a combination of trying to um, illustrate some of the questions in the aging field that I'm struggling with right now and take a few guesses at answers. I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the questions I think in the aging field are, are pertinent, at least in my mind, and also co conclude by talking about what we're trying to do in Singapore to really validate interventions in humans. I'll throw in a little bit of data on a small molecule in between. And I think that probably, I don't have to show this slide to most people that have been watching this show. I think it illustrates the 
key point that we're really trying to make in, in, in longevity research, which is that um, the typical approach is to uh, do what I call sick care, which is don't really pay attention to the person and, and while they're still healthy, but when they get older and start to get chronic diseases, to spend a lot of money trying to treat all of these individ diseases as if they're individual problems. And I think we are pretty clear now uh, from a lot of different fields of research that that's not the case, that in fact, there are things in common with these diseases and probably the most uh, pertinent one of those, particularly for tonight, is aging, which is the biggest risk factor for all of these different conditions and many, many others. Uh, and so the simple concept is we need to move from sick care to real health care, which is more of a life course approach designed to keep people healthy, keep people functional, keep them disease free for as long as possible, and then manage the diseases and try to treat the diseases when they eventually arise. Uh, and of course, even that is an underestimation because in reality, aging is not just driving chronic disease, but it's driving the response to infectious diseases like COVID-19. Uh, so the severity is much worse if you're over the age of 70. And it's also driving functional decline. And I won't show data on that today, but I think everybody realizes that um, cognitive and physical function declines as you get older. And so the approach really is conceptually very simple. You know, you're, you're born, you're healthy for a long period of time. Eventually you start getting sick. You get one or more diseases. That's when medicine steps in and spends a lot of money trying to treat them. Uh, and medicine does work. It keeps you alive longer. Sometimes it can cure diseases, but most of the time it helps people manage them. Eventually it gets to be too much and, and, and people suffer mortality. Uh, and what we want to do is intervene earlier during this green part of the curve to extend this period of health span, uh, which will also probably extend lifespan as well, but we think it will compress morbidity. In other words, health span will go up at least as fast, if not faster than lifespan. And if we do that, that's a huge economic victory and also the best way to affect quality of life because we're keeping people disease-free and functional. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about these, these two papers that came out almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and one of them described hallmarks of aging. There were nine of them. Uh, the other one described pillars of aging. There were seven of them. There's some overlap between them. Uh, and I think they've been very useful in the field because they sort of galvanized thinking a little bit on what's causing aging. And they've stimulated some of the private sector investment uh, in trying to target aging, which is great. Uh, but I think they also raise a lot of questions. These are not the end result of aging research. These are a, a, a kind of a temperature check along the way. And the question really to me is, what does this mean with respect to aging? Uh, and how much do we really know? So if you take the pillars, for instance, which I'm more familiar with, um, you have seven of them, and I could go into detail about each of them and how they are linked to aging. All of them are. Uh, but the fact is that they're also highly interconnected to each other. When you have altered metabolism, it leads to increased inflammation. That leads to increased damage, decreases adult stem cell function. You can really get from any point, any pillar to any other pillar very easily with a few molecular pathways. So in reality, I'm not sure that uh, this concept that people are taking right now, which is to just target every pillar uh, individually and then add up all the results is going to really lead to synergistic value. So what are the questions I think we're facing when it comes to mechanisms of aging? Um, first of all, we can ask the question, are they complete? Are these hallmarks and pillars, do they describe all the facets of aging? How many are there? I don't think anyone would argue that they're complete. There have been reviews that have come out since then that have said there are as many 20, as 20 different hallmarks of aging. Um, some of them are redundant and overlap, and so it's a, little, a lot of it depends on semantics. But it's still an open question whether we've caught all of the major things that control aging or not. Um, second of all, are there hierarchies? In other words, uh, are some, some hallmarks or pillars primary events leading to secondary events, which are other hallmarks. In other words, there's damage causing inflammation. Um, and I, I think that's a lot of effort is now going into trying to figure out how things are connected to each other. And come, that brings us to the next point, which is the interconnectivity. And, and I've been trying to sort of propose a, a network concept for this that really 
Um, it's not so much about any one way that you measure aging or one mechanism, but it's about how they're all connected. And the, what we're really looking at here is a systemic approach by the body to maintain health in the context of aging, which leads to damage to molecules. You're affected by environmental factors, genetic factors. Uh, and in context of all of that, your body wants to stay healthy. And so this network is in place to try to do that. And that slowly breaks down over time. So that sounds good. A lot of people like it when they hear that. The problem is, what does that really mean? Uh, at, at a mechanistic level or a real reality level in the body, what is this network doing? How is it established? What tissues is it operating in? There are a lot of questions that haven't been answered. And coming back to this point I mentioned earlier, should we target each hill, hallmark or pillar separately and hope that they have additive effects and make combined interventions, will that work or not? Uh, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. So if we look at the interventions that are out there, you've heard about a lot of them this year from different speakers on the program. Uh, they're really different kinds. They're lifestyle interventions. And I think that uh, there's quite a bit of data that exercise impacts uh, health span and probably median life expectancy. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of data on healthy diets and aging, although there's not a complete agreement in that area yet. We can talk about that. Um, managing stress, sleep quality, all of these things likely impact the aging process. And so, you know, it's possible for people now to affect their own aging process by developing sustainable, healthy lifestyles. I think beyond that, there are small molecules, and that's where a lot of the field, including my lab, are right now. And um, we're really trying to look at natural products and drugs that can slow or reverse aspects of the aging process. And then there's another sphere that our circle that's uh, broader and less dark at the moment because it's not as well researched. And that are sort of radical interventions. And that could be gene therapy. It could be stem cell therapy, cell replacement therapy. There are all kinds of different approaches that are being considered. And, and in reality, some of those may have a much bigger effect than the first two circles, but they're really not ready for prime time, at least in humans yet. Um, and so I think it'll be exciting to see where that leads and maybe they'll come on board in the near future. These are things that uh, I work on in, in the lab uh, and uh, I'm happy to talk about any of them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about alpha ketoglutarate today and just mention spermidine, just a couple slides. Uh, but really, uh, I think there are probably as many as 100 small molecules that you can make an argument might affect the human aging process. And fundamentally, the challenge is to figure out which ones really work in humans uh, and uh, which interventions are best for which people. And I'll come to that later. Um, let's talk about spermidine just for an example. And, and I'm using this as an example because if we go back to the you know, pillars and hallmarks of aging, one of the features of this is that the interventions that work to slow aging don't uh, necessarily just affect one pillar. I'm gonna give you a bunch of examples really quickly here, and I think you'll see a common trend emerging. So spermidine is something that was uh, studied by Frank Medeo and Guido Kramer and others, and reported to potentially be a longevity molecule. And this was some of the data that was shown by other labs, uh, showing that you can start at four months of age or start at mice at 18 months of age. And in both cases, you get modest lifespan extension. Now, one of the things that happens a lot is it's hard to repeat some interventions in other laboratories. And we set out to look at spermidine. And one of the things I want to say is that we see this as well. So at least in our hands, spermidine is a natural product that can impact aging uh, and extend lifespan. We also, as an aside, were able to show that spermidine actually protects mice from a high fat diet. And that's common of a lot of different interventions. So it has metabolic effects that may be related to aging. But my main point with spermidine is if you take a step back and look at the literature, spermidine does almost everything. It affects every single pillar of hallmark of aging. Uh, these are just some examples of data that's out there on different uh, tissues and organisms, and you can link spermidine to everything. And it's not just spermidine. Here's sirtuins. This is a recent uh, review where sirtuins are affecting neuroprotection, cardioprotection, they're anti-inflammatory, they affect metabolism, they're good for your kidneys, they're good for your liver. 
Uh, all of the pillars of aging are reported to be affected by activating sirtuins with things like NAD precursors. mTOR is no different. This is a slide with the seven pillars of aging from 2015. And these are just papers that have been published either linking sirtuins or mTOR to each of the pillars of aging. And so I think you can see that the least was 46 papers linking mTOR to aging. And since 2015, those numbers have gone up dramatically, both with sirtuins and mTOR. So again, mTOR, rapamycin, same thing. Metformin, the same thing. Here's a paper by Nir Barzilai, a review showing that metformin does practically everything linked to pillars and hallmarks of aging. Senolytics, this is a recent uh, paper showing a very similar thing. And you heard Jim Kirkland's talk last week, maybe, where he talks about the many, many benefits of getting rid of senescent cells. So this is a trend of almost every major longevity molecule is that they don't target one thing. They seem to target everything. And so then what are the takeaways from this? Um, as I just said, they're not targeting one hallmark or pillar of aging. And now there may be primary and secondary effects. It's possible that they target one thing or two things, and then that has knock-on effects on other pillars and hallmarks, and you can read it out as affecting everything. Um, but it doesn't seem like specific interventions are what's being identified so far. This also means that combinations of interventions aren't going to be as easy as it sounds. It's not going to be just adding up seven things that hit seven pillars and you get immortality. And in fact, if we look in our mouse studies, and when we try to combine different interventions, we often see that things are not additive. And sometimes they even cancel each other out. So uh, it's not obvious how to mix things together to get bigger effects on longevity at this point. And I think that's a major research question going forward. And then the question is, if you really try to target specific pillars or hallmarks, will that work better or even at all? And I'd say that the, the data right now isn't that good. I mean, there's been a lot of effort to try to target reactive oxygen species or one particular type of damage in the cell. And so far, most of those interventions, if you look at the really well-controlled mouse longevity studies, they don't really impact lifespan. So that, that may be that they're just choosing the wrong way to target those things. Um, but I think it's an open question about how specific we want to look when we identify interventions. Are we really looking for things that hit nodes in a network? Or are we looking for things that specifically alter hallmarks and pillars? We can't really answer the question yet. So I want to turn to AKG, which is another intervention, which I think can, could fall into the same category. It does many different things affecting different pillars of aging. This came from a collaboration, and I'm part of this company, so full disclosure, uh, Ponce de Leon Health. And they were helping, looking, using uh, Gordon Lithgow's lab and my lab at the Buck Institute to try to identify combinations of natural products that have additive effects on lifespan and health span. And so there's a combination on the market, which I'll talk about just briefly. But in the mouse studies, I'm going to show you just three or four slides looking at alpha ketoglutarate directly. And when we got to the mouse studies, what we did is we added a alpha ketoglutarate in a calcium form at 18 months of age and followed the animals all the way to death, uh, looking at survival, looking at frailty in the animals, uh, and also looking at sort of the molecular hallmarks of aging. Uh, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of data on this. It's published last year. So this was what happened in survival. Uh, we started at 18 months of age. There was about a 5 to 10% increase in female lifespan with alpha ketoglutarate, a less, less of an increase in males, which was not significant in one cohort, although we see this consistently across cohorts. Um, and so the effects on longevity are not that great. What really jumped out at us, though, was the effect on frailty. Uh, and so this is probably the most complicated slide I'm going to show you here. Every dot is a frailty score for, each, for an animal. So these are females, but the male data is identical to this. At 18 months of age, and then at 21, 23 months, et cetera. This really, it's a composite of 31 different measures in the animals of, of frailty. And the higher the score, the more frail the animal is. And you can see the blue circles go up faster than the red circles, so that the control is getting more frail than the alpha ketoglutarate treated mice. But this is perhaps not the easiest way to look at this because take this animal, which was very frail at 23 months, in reality, it's dead by 25 months. And so uh, you're losing animals along the way. So what we did is we replotted the data after all the animals died and looked at the percentage of the lifespan where we measured the frailty score, 50 to 60%, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 100. 
And you can see frailty goes up steadily in the control animals and it's largely suppressed in the alpha ketoglutarate treated animals. So there's a 50% reduction in frailty and only a 10% extension in lifespan. So the hypothesis we have is that this molecule is really compressing morbidity in these animals. Now, here's my slide showing AKD, AKG does everything, just like all the other interventions. It's in the TCA cycle, so it's involved in um, uh, central metabolism. It's involved in amino acid uh, catabolic processes. It affects oxidative stress. It activates a number of enzymes linked to aging, including uh, DNA demethylases that are linked to the uh, biologic clocks. Uh, it activates hif one alpha which is a low oxygen response that's been shown to affect aging. It's anti-inflammatory and does many other things. Um, we've shown that it increases adult stem cell function, improves metabolic flexibility, enhances cellular respiration. We're now looking at the microbiome and finding interesting things. One of the biggest effects in the mice was reduced inflammation. But what about in humans? And so I'm going to tell you about a human study, and I, I'm going to just tell you as a caveat to start, this was not a placebo controlled clinical study. This is just users of the product called Rejuvent. And we had 42 users that uh, participated in this. They took a DNA methylation test, uh, which is a simple form of a DNA methylation test you can do from putting saliva on a piece of paper called a TRUME test at baseline and then again at seven months. And this is what the data from them looked like. So uh, we had 14 females and 28 males. Uh, the average chronologic age was in the 60s. And uh, rather than go through the table, I think I'll just show you the graph. Uh, what's happening here, this is the baseline for each participant, and this is the seven months. And we're looking at chronologic age minus the biologic age. So when it goes up, that means you're getting biologically younger if, if this methylation test is an accurate measure of biologic age. So there's about a seven year reduction in biologic age with just seven months on the product. I should say the product is not just a time release version of alpha ketoglutarate. It also contains low dose vitamin A for males, low dose vitamin D for females. Um, the effects were same in the males and females. Uh, and one of the interesting things from this study was uh, if you look at related factors to the response effect, uh, we found two things that defined how well a person responded. One was higher chronologic age at baseline. So older people responded more, which I wasn't really predicting. Uh, and another thing we found is that if you were biologically older than your chronologic age, in other, way, in other words, not aging well, according to this test, you responded better. Uh, and so that's an intriguing facet. Now, I don't want to argue that we have complete evidence that, that this product or alpha ketoglutarate reverses aging. We don't have that. This is just data from participants using one biomarker of aging. And so what we're doing now is trying to extend that and look in really placebo controlled clinical studies to try to assess what's really happening in a, in a better controlled fashion. And that brings us to the question of how do we really validate interventions uh, that affect human aging. Uh, and the field has really struggled with this over the years. Uh, companies have tended to take the approach that even if they have a molecule that they got because they think it affects longevity, a resveratrol, or to an activating compounds, many of these come to mind, they can't treat aging directly because aging is not a disease. So you can't get reimbursed for it. It's, you can't get a product approved for it. If it's, an, if it's a real drug. So the, the approach they've tended to take is to try to find a disease that's related to aging or related to the pathway that their potential drug hits and try to get approval for that disease with the idea that eventually they'll roll it back toward a, a generalized aging approach. Um, this hasn't worked so well so far. I think one of the problems is that uh, which disease do you pick? If you're going to take rapamycin, for instance, you could pick any of hundreds of different diseases, and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses in terms of clinical studies. But I think there's also a conceptual problem here, which is that what may affect aging while you're generally healthy may not have the similar effect when you're in a chronic disease state, when the, when the whole molecular system is adjusted uh, due to one or more uh, multiple diseases as you get older. So, uh, so far, this hasn't worked that well, but many private companies are taking this approach. And I think it makes sense and from the perspective of 
developing uh, drugs that are not natural products that are not easy to get to the market. Another approach is to try to prevent multiple diseases simultaneously. And the TAME trial that Nir Barzilai talked about earlier in the year with metformin is a perfect example with this. This is a, what I call a health span trial. Uh, and that's focused on giving lots of people drugs for a long period of time, uh, looking to see if you can prevent multiple diseases simultaneously. So this is a very logical approach if you're targeting aging, but it's also extremely expensive and very long. Uh, so it's hard to get the money to do many of these trials. And then there's another approach which uses mostly aging biomarkers. So trying to measure the rate of aging using some of these new biomarkers that have, we've talked about a lot this year, like methylation clock. And this is very amenable to lifestyle interventions and natural products. Now, these biomarkers are not fully validated yet for aging, but I think that at least I believe that they're really telling us uh, something about aging and there will be useful as endpoints to see if interventions work or not. I've already showed you the AKG study. And with AKG, now the study that's being done at Indiana University, which is almost completed now, is a nine-month intervention uh, looking at 100 participants, placebo-controlled, males and females, looking at safety. And I can already tell you that there's no safety issues with the study. Uh, th and also looking at inflammatory markers and aging biomarkers as outcomes. What we're doing and are planning to do in Singapore is a sustained release. I, I should say that we think sustained release is important. Study with calcium alpha ketoglutarate, similar design, uh, and, but looking at a lot more markers of aging, including a lot of physiologic parameters. And this is the kind of study we're looking at doing in iteration with different interventions right now as a starting point to see if we can modify human aging. And so the approach really with human studies is to validate that things work. Not everything in a mouse is gonna work in a humans. And I don't think anybody can predict which ones are gonna work best at this point. I think ultimately we need to figure out ways to personalize. Some people will respond better to some interventions than others. And that'll depend on their lifestyle and their genetics. Uh, and we don't have a great way to do that yet. I think we need to think about that. And we need to scale. So academically, we're taking an approach where we're looking at interventions that are cost-effective and also biomarkers that measure aging that are cost-effective so that when we have something we think works, we can move that into communities and maybe uh, throughout Singapore uh, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, I've already kind of outlined what we're doing with the AKG, but it's to take healthy or pre-diseased people, look at a number of different biomarkers and compare in as agnostic a way as we can, different kinds of interventions, supplements, uh, repurposed drugs like rapamycin, uh, dietary interventions, lifestyle interventions, et cetera, see which ones work best. I think that if we can compare things side by side, that's something a lot of companies are not doing because they have their favorite molecule and that's what they're looking at. We need to know which ones work better than others. And we're looking at lots of different biomarkers, including DNA methylation clocks, uh, autoantibodies, telomeres, uh, systemic inflammatory markers, levels of senescent cells, uh, you heard Jackie Hahn talk about three-dimensional facial pattern analysis of biologic age, uh, and then physiologic parameters, uh, physical activity, DEXA scores, uh, pulse wave velocity, clinical measures. And one of the big questions is how do these different biomarkers interact with each other, which I think will be exciting to get data on. So the idea is to take small studies with in-depth data, try to see things that are working, move them to RCTs as quickly as possible, and then into the community as soon as we can. And I just wanna close by saying that we've realigned how we're doing our mouse aging studies now. We're doing shorter interventions starting at 18 months, and instead of using survival, we're using uh, biologic aging markers and frailty and other parameters that are more aligned with the kinds of studies we're doing in humans because we want these studies to predict better outcomes in humans and we can't look at survival in humans. So if we can align the length of intervention and the endpoints better, we hopefully can get better uh, correlation between the outcomes that we're seeing. And that'll include doing iterative testing and refining back and forth as we go forward. I think it's important to have these things going on side by side there's a lot to learn from the mice, but we don't wanna be sent down blind alleys testing things that don't work in humans. So hopefully we can align things a little bit better with this approach. So with that, I think I'm gonna stop. Uh, 
it's great to be at, in Singapore. I have a lot of collaborators there in terms of uh, faculty, Andrea, for sure. We're already having a great time working together. I've listed a few that we published papers with, but we're working with a lot of different people here now, and it's an exciting place to be. And also, um, together, we have a really big lab now that's producing a lot of exciting data, uh, and you'll hear about that more uh, as the show goes on uh, in the future. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, back to you, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Brian. Um, <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Let's 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 see. Let's start with the outcome parameters because in the last twenty years, I think we really discovered why we are aging. You said there are hallmarks and there are pillars. I think it's a little bit semantic, but we know why we are aging. And I think when I grew up a little bit during my PhD, we thought it is in essence it's one pillar or it's inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's very complicated. There are lots of interactions. But thinking that through, what does it mean for trials to actually measure the outcomes if it's so complicated and complex and so, so many interactions? So how could we then um, overcome that problem if we are measuring uh, in outcome? So do we need outcome measures, biomarkers, which tackle all the hallmarks or the pillars? Or is methylation age um, the only one to do? Well, I think there's a lot of viewpoints on that right now. And, uh, you know, the, the, we've had discussions in the past about um, biomarkers of individual organs versus a biomarker of systemic aging, like the methylation clock. There are people trying to develop biomarkers of each of the pillars and hallmarks. And um, I don't know that we know the answer. I, I, I like to think of it more in terms of the systemic versus organ-specific markers. And uh, this is a bit naive, but I kind of feel like the systemic markers might be kind of holistically measuring how that network functions, whereas the organ-specific markers are influenced by, by that, but they're probably measuring what's going on in a, with aging in, a, in the liver or the adipose tissue or the brain, et cetera. Um, and so ultimately, it probably is a combination of those things. The way I see it is that if the network is functioning well, you, you probably won't get sick. Um, but when the network starts to break down, then it kind of depends on how different organs are doing, uh, de which defines what kind of chronic disease you get and, and how you lose function with age. Uh, and so it's probably some kind of combination, but um, how, we, how we tease that out, I think is still an open question. And whether you can get biomarkers that measure specific hallmarks or pillars and what they mean, I think is also an open question. Yeah, but most of the times in trials, we're using the methylation clocks, um, wh whatever clock, there are lots on the market. So, and we are measuring in, in blood. Would that then be enough? Do you agree with that approach of the field? Well, I think the clocks are, are, you know, a lot of them, the one we used is not as well studied because, but it was very easy for people at home to send in samples. So we chose that one. Um, but if you look at some of the more tested clocks that have been looked at in sort of the big databases, they seem to predict mortality. Uh, they, some of them predict disease onset or frailty. Um, and there's other studies out there suggesting that they're responsive to interventions. And so those are three of the big things we want from a biomarker. So I do think there's utility in the methylation clocks. Um, I think the, the frustrating thing about them is we don't know what that means for mechanism at this point. And so studies like what Morgan Levine is doing to try to deconstruct these clocks and get back to mechanisms, and maybe that's through hallmarks or pillars, um, could be very interesting. Uh, but so I do think they'll be valuable, but I think one of the most important things for our studies and other people doing similar things is to really understand how these different biomarkers interact with each other. I, we, I would say we largely don't have an answer for that yet. And they, all of them take aging as a major all of them take the chronologic age of a person as a factor into them, either directly or indirectly. And so the real question is, if you extract out that principal component that's aging from the final clocks, do they relate to each other or not? And I'm not sure. I think they probably will to some extent, but I don't know how much. So. Fully agree. I think um, uh, really seeing how they are working or certain mechanisms compared to certain outcomes would be much better than... Um, really trying to link them to chronological age. Um, I, I would like to little, a little bit touch on um, the translation from animal models into to humans. And I think you nicely showed 
that while trialing, for example, alpha ketoglutarate in, in, in mice really showed nice results, then you transferred that to humans and now we are doing this or we'll do the, the nice studies. Um, I think this is a very nice, nice example, but can you a little bit elaborate what we really learned from animal models and what not? When do we maybe skip the animal models or not using mice and, and using other animal models to really translate what we already know to humans? Well, first of all, there are a lot of animal models out there. And so mice are not the only ones. You can get a lot of data from actually probably rats are arguably a better model of human aging than mice, but they're very expensive. Okay. <laughs> um, what's the reason why they are better? Uh, they tend to have more uh, parameters of aging related decline that are linked to aging. Uh, kidney disease comes to mind, uh, heart, uh, cardiac, um, arterial function declines in a better way. So they look more like human aging by many parameters, um, but they, it's harder to keep large numbers of them. Uh, of course, primate aging may be even better, but nobody wants to wait around that long for most primate models and their ethical issues. Um, killifish are interesting because they age very rapidly. Um, and so I think there are a lot of models out there. Uh, none of them are great models for human aging. All of them are decent models for huge, human aging probably. And I think it's important to figure out which components are conserved and which components are not. Um, I think there's a couple of things that people, you know, mouse models have gotten kind of a bad rap lately. And I think it's partly because they're misused. And if you look at disease context, especially, I, I like to use Alzheimer's as an example. Mice don't get a classical form of Alzheimer's disease, even though they get neurodegeneration with aging. And so rather than study the normal neurodegeneration with aging, what people do is they engineer a human disease in a mouse. And then they do it at five months of age in a mouse, which is not an old mouse. So an artificial disease in a young mouse, and you know, you get some drug that works and then you put it on an old human and it doesn't work. And you know, I, I don't I think using age appropriate mice is a good start. And I think it might be more important to look at the natural decline with aging in tissues, even if they don't completely align with the human disease, that may tell you more about what's going on in humans than trying to create a new disease in a mouse that's never seen it before. So um, I think we can improve how we do the mouse studies. And that's one example, uh, but you know, it's never gonna be as good as doing human studies. And I, I'm not against going directly to human studies if it's the right context and the right, you know, there's the right safety profile and the right question can be asked. I think we have to use the all of these models, including humans, <laughs> to yeah. the best we can. <laughs> so yeah, and maybe more wild type uh, mice um, experiments. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but your, the AKG one is, is, is very intriguing, of course, I think also for the listeners, look, if you by seven months, and of course, it was not a randomized control trial, but if it's true, seven months of AKG lowers the um, epigenetic age by a couple of years, that's a massive. So what do you foresee, see of, of imagine the randomized control trials are, are positive? Would then such a supplement or a drug, would that be given over the counter? And um, what, how would you see, should we then measure the effect of the interventions? How, how, what are the next steps? Because we already know in NMN of NR, um, these are already over the counter and you can take it. I know AKG is also yeah. available already over the counter. But what is in your, uh, in your view the best next step to really make an, a health um, effect? Well, I haven't seen any of these single things yet and a really good clinical study have a positive impact. And so I'd like to see that first. I mean, I think we're, we're you know, it's hard when you, when you work with natural product companies that work with natural products, it's a different mindset. They don't have a hundred million dollars to test, you know, a, a phase three trial with hundreds of participants because they're not going to sell the product for enough money to get the return back. So it's really about trying to get them to do as good a studies as possible and controlled studies. And, and so I think that's what we need to see. Um, I, I kind of feel like it's, um, you know, these are early adopters that are buying these things. They are, they're safe. I think it's okay for them to do that. And what, what I want to see is an educated public 
making their own decisions when it comes to these natural products. So we, we don't want to mislead people. I think that's one of the most important things. I also think there will be a placebo effect on aging. I think that people that pay money for a product are going to measure as a couple of years younger. And so we saw like a seven year effect with this, but that may be a combination of placebo and hopefully some efficacy from the product as well. Um, I, I, I think that, all of these things are, are, are open questions and we're going to have to just do a few more studies looking at more kinds of biomarkers to really convince ourselves that, that things are working. I, I hope some of them do. Um, and I think some of them will, but uh, you know, if you're waiting for something that's fully validated before you adopt it, I don't think we're there yet with anything but exercise. So. Yeah, that, that, that's true. But of course we are working on the pipeline of RCTs to really test it. Yeah, exactly. That, that brings me a little bit to the to the next question before um, really also looking at what um, uh, the audience is asking you. Um, there there is so much academic research or growing academic research, but there is a booming business in the private sector and uh, companies. What what is the role of academia in the longevity field? Because there's such a booming business of private investors and their ways, companies, etc. How do you see the field and how can we work together and maybe also avoid a conflict of interest if there is any? Well, I, I think we, we have to work together because both sides have advantages that the other doesn't. Um, the private sector can throw a lot of money at a question and that sometimes you need to do that. And I think that also raises public excitement and awareness when there's a private sector growing. So, and sometimes private sector have influences over public policy that academics don't have. So uh, I think it's good that there's so much money coming into the longevity field. Uh, but as I said in the talk, you know, there's also the problem that whatever company you have is trying to develop their product. Uh, and uh, I think what we're trying to do, and hopefully others like us, where we're comparing different things uh, in an agnostic way, hopefully, that we can get more meaningful data out of that. You know, and I think also right now, it's kind of the wild west in the aging space. You've got all kinds of companies starting doing all kinds of different things. Some of them are really just treating chronic diseases of aging and calling themselves an aging company. Uh, others are really trying to target longevity directly or trying to use biomarkers to better measure longevity or um, educational programs or therapeutic programs to help people adopt healthier lifestyles. Um, I don't know how that's all going to sort out. I'm excited that that's happening because I think that it should happen. This is a big question to answer, but I don't think anybody knows who the winners and losers are going to be. Um, there's always conflict, you know, and, 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 the, and the, the key thing is to try to manage conflict effectively so you um, are, are not taking advantage of any situation. But, you know, the, the alternative to that is having academics that don't talk to companies. And I think that's a, even worse. No, that was 20 years ago, I would say. Yeah. So uh, managing yeah. conflict and um, really looking for quality. I think that's yeah, that's very I important agree. and working together. But let's see, what, what does the audience um, have for questions? Hatay Tip Tassina is our postdoc. Are there any questions? Hi, Andrea, thank you. And also thank you, Brian. It's uh, my honor to, to moderate the session today. It's a very special episode. We have a lot of questions, so um, I will start with a more generic one. Um, okay, so the audience asks, um, uh, okay, maybe generic, but also very personal. Um, the audience asks, you have been conducting research in the aging field for over 20 years. What made you interested in it in the first place? Yeah, I, it, you can just say it. I'm an aging, aging researcher. It's fine. Uh, the, uh, actually, I didn't get interested. Well, I guess there's two answers to that question. One is that I was an only child in my whole family, basically. I had two cousins, but they were like over a decade older than me. And it was the older people in my family all live forever. So I was around a lot of aging people. I've talked about my grandmothers both reaching 100, for example. And so I was fascinated by what was happening to people as they get older. Why were some people active and some people, they were physically inactive? Why were some people happy and others depressed? And But I, that was one trend. I think when I got to graduate school, though, we wanted to work on yeast cells. There was another graduate student who later working with me who later became a priest. And we worked in Lenny Garanti's lab. And we were trying to figure out what's the strangest thing we could do with yeast cells. And, and it 
and we decided uh, studying aging in a yeast cell was pretty crazy. And so that's what motivated us to do it. it. It really wasn't about extending human health span at the time. It was about nobody knew much about aging and we just wanted to answer some basic question using a simple organism. But over time, you know, I, I saw more the importance of this field and what it can do for humanity. So uh, I, I think it's, I think I'm in it now to try to do something good for human health span, but there's always that little bit of me that just wants to know what's, what's going on. Why, are, why is this happening to everybody? Uh, it's my extreme. You, you, first, you have a, a lot of aging humans in your family, but then later on, you started studying yeast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm Seems not like sure what that relation thing. is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then there's a priest. <laughs> and there's a, we'll have the, we'll have, his name is Nick Ostriaco. He actually does research now too. So we'll have him on one of the shows. Uh, he's a really fascinating guy. Okay, uh, we look forward to that. So uh, next question can be a bit challenging because it may take you a long time to answer, but I still want a concise answer because we have more questions, okay? So um, many audience want to know how how did we even learn of like 20 different hallmarks? Uh, like how do we know that they are the best proxies for aging and are those validated in the first place or do you think there is some kind of omitted variable bias there? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the aging field, when I started in it, uh, people were still spending a lot of time arguing that one thing was causing aging, reactive oxygen species, DNA damage, protein misfolding, telomere shortening, stem cell exhaustion, you know, and so people were thinking about most of these things a long time ago. I, I think what happened is over time, we start to see the connectedness of the different pathways. Uh, and that led uh, Carlos Lopez Oten first, and then our group second to try to put that together into hallmarks and pillars. Um, so that's, uh, but I also think it's a it's a work in progress. We're not at a point where those are the only things regulating aging, or even maybe maybe we're missing some of the really important things. And people have speculated on that. So I I don't know that. I, I think there's good evidence for all of those hallmarks and pillars being linked to the aging process. Uh, but I, whether they're the most important ones or the right semantic way to describe aging, I think is an open question at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, it's asking about the study of progeria. Um, the audience is interested to know whether there is any progress in that or like probably like, is this the best model for accelerated aging? Yeah, so we, we've worked on progeria. I didn't talk about it today. We're not doing as much now on it. So we focused on Hutchison-Guilford progeria syndrome, which is a probably the most one of the most severe and one of the most directly linked to accelerated aging. So kids that get this disease, it's there are only about 400 in the world, um, really have rapid changes that make them look very old. So their skin ages, uh, they lose hair, but they also have cardiovascular aging and often die by heart attacks and strokes in their teens. Um, there are mouse models for this that are pretty good and uh, you can try to understand aging using them or try to look at interventions which slow aging. It's interesting because some of those interventions that affect normal aging work in progeria models and some don't. And I think that kind of makes sense because these progerias are what are segmental progerias. And what that means is they recapitulate some aspects of the normal aging process, but not all of them. And so if the intervention or the pathway that you're interested in happens to be in one of those affected uh, seg you know, segmental pathways in progeria, then you'll see an effect. But that doesn't mean if some intervention doesn't affect aging in a progeria model, that it's not linked to normal aging. So I think they're good Hutchinson Gilford is only one example. There are Werner syndrome and a few others, uh, cocaine syndrome uh, that people use. And I think they are very informative, but they don't recapitulate all the features of normal aging. To link to that, let's say when we talk about aging in general, and we say that we should target aging just like how we target other disease. Do you see aging as something that we should like, um, whether we can get the intervention or the drug that work for everyone, or do you think it will it will have to be like personalized medicine. It will be um, specific to uh, subgroups of the population. Well, I, I suspect it'll be specific to subgroups of the population. Hopefully we can find things that work for a significant number of people, but 
Um, I'm, I'd be shocked if we didn't find that some interventions work better for some people and other interventions work better for other people. Even exercise, right? Exercise is personalized, right? I can, if I tell everybody to go be marathon runners, it's not going to be healthy for a lot of people. So, you know, the level of exercise, the kind of exercise, those are personalized too. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's going to be personalized, but I, I hope that some of these interventions have a general enough effect that we can see um, uh, changes to aging in, in population-based studies. And then we can also learn from those studies by doing phenotyping to figure out why some people respond and others don't. Yeah, I'm just going to go straight out quickly because uh, we have a few minutes. Um, uh, one of the audience is wondering whether like, you would recommend people to take red suvent and what are the possible side effects if taking them in the long run? Well, th this falls under this conflict question because <laughs> I'm involved with the company. So uh, I don't want to make specific recommendations. I will say that the product, it contains three components that are all generally regarded as safe. They've all been tested extensively without safety indications at the doses that are in the product. So I don't think there's any significant safety concerns. Uh, I think it really is, like I said earlier, with all of these products right now, it depends on whether you want to be an early adopter, try to be ahead of the curve, uh, and knowing that we don't know for sure whether it's going to work or not, uh, or do you want to wait and see you know, the more clinically controlled studies, which ones work better and try to, you know, then pick the things that are best for you. I, I don't want to tell people what to do in that context. How about stem cells, uh, stem cell injection? Uh, some people are using it as like, you know, anti-aging therapy. Yeah, I, I think those are interesting. Uh, so a lot of what's doing is people are getting mesenchymal stem cell injections, which are, um, as far as I can tell, safe. And the question is, do they actually alter aspects of aging? Uh, and I don't think we have good data on it because a lot of this is being done in clinics where there's not clinically, you know, placebo-controlled studies. Uh, and in fact, we're not even, in many cases, they are not even measures of aging biomarkers or aging parameters yet. So I would hope we can start to um, generate some real data on that. I think it does show promise because these, like mesenchymal stem cells, for example, uh, persist for a reasonable amount of time in the body, even if they're not autologous, and they secrete anti-inflammatory factors. So there's a hypothetical reason why they could work, but I don't think there's much data yet. Okay, some of the people watching this webinars are already taking some um, uh, supplements. Okay, let me try that. Um, uh oh. Uh, <laughs> so you okay? I will read it out. Okay, you mentioned that we do not yet know enough about combining interventions. Would yeah. you warn specifically against combining some of these specific supplements? I'm not against it in concept. I just want to see data that it works. Yeah. And uh, when we put things together, a lot of times we don't see that. And we don't know why even in animal models. So, um, you know, I try to tell people that if they're going to get ahead of the curve and start taking things that they should really limit what they're doing to one or two things. Because, you know, if you're taking 10 different supplements, hard to know what's happening. I fully agree with you because we see that in the medical field where we have polypharmacy, where lots of medications are being taken and these act not synergistically most of the time, so not, not always. So be careful and um, wait, there will be a pipeline of randomized control trials. Yeah. I, and I think that like, imagine it this way, if turning down the TOR pathway might be good, but most of these interventions do that. So if you combine them together, you might be turning it down too much. And that, that is, you need the TOR pathway for certain activities in the body. Yeah. So, um, you know, too much of a good thing might be a bad thing. And that's just a hypothetical example of why things might not be good. But honestly, I can't predict what's going to be additive and what isn't in a mouse at this point. So um, we're still, we have to understand more mechanistically how to make those predictions and validate which things work together. Yeah. But we already know that exercise, for example, works. There's lots of studies. And then adding, for example, one supplement might be the way to go for people who really want to um, go to the limit. Yeah, and you can measure these methylation tests on your own now too. So uh, there are many companies doing that. So it's uh, you can get some data uh, to see what's happening and then yeah. try one thing at a time maybe. Aim, last question. 
Can I have two? I think it's number. <laughs> yeah. Short question, short answer. Uh, short questions, Brian. Uh, yeah. Um, does targeting only one pillar do more harm than good? Do you think interventions such as exercise or diet um, that might affect all the pillars will be better than drugs that target only one pillar? I don't know yet. I mean, uh, certainly the interventions that work in lifestyle or small molecules target multiple or even all the pillars. You can always make the argument that if you could specifically target the one pillar in the right way, that you would have a bigger effect. Uh, I haven't seen that yet, but it's also that's something that's harder to do than because a lot of these interventions that have found so far by general discovery based approaches, screening lots of different things or targeting a particular pathway. Uh, and that's a signaling pathway. Um, that's a, probably an easier way to go about finding things than saying, how do I specifically, you know, target one thing? And, and uh, uh, so, but I don't, right now, I think the systemic things will work better, but I, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Uh, last question. Uh, what are some of the long-term plans for the Center for Healthy Longevity in Singapore, like in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing is to get in the clinic and and develop better and better ways to measure aging that are scalable and to fight, figure out which interventions are working uh, and which ones are working in which people. I, there's a lot of, you know, this healthy longevity program, we have 30, 40 faculty almost that are working on all kinds of different aspects of aging. They're doing some really exciting research. We'll have more of those people on in the, in the future to talk about their work. Um, uh, and certainly there are a lot of basic aspects of aging and how aging links to disease that need to be discovered. I think for the aging field in general, though, we have to get some validation in humans that we can go to public health policy people, the government officials and say, hey, this is the way to go. And the time is now to really start to do that. So I think that's the most important thing we can do at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, Brian, thank and you. thank you very much, uh, Aim. <laughs> Hope um, that you all enjoyed the webinar as, as I did. I think there will be lots of more discussions. I just want to remind you, of course, we have a couple of speakers already being planned for next year that uh, you are going to um, use the link in the chat room or um, use the link for the in the weekly invitation post-webinar email to um, re-sign of sign in and up to our webinar and I would also like to know what you if you have any feedback so please use the chat function for the um, to give us and leave us some some feedback and the panelists and all attendees uh, function um, we will have a short Christmas break uh, on the 6th of January Professor Linda Pat um, Petrich will, will be here and join Brian Kennedy to talk about if aging can be cured. So hopefully you will also join um, and you will uh, enjoy Christmas. Um, as always, we have a final video and today we will see what changes when we get older. Take care and enjoy hopefully your break. To me, the thing about old people is that everything about them gets smaller. You know, their bodies get smaller, they move into smaller places, they sleep less time, they eat smaller meals, except the car. The older they get, the bigger their car gets. I've never understood that. And old people have a way of backing out of the driveway, you know what I mean? They don't turn from side to side, they just go, I'm old, I've been waiting a long time, I'm backing it out. You know, I'm coming back. Watch out, buddy, I'm coming, you know. And you gotta watch out for them. And then once they get out there, they drive so slowly, and I would think the less time you have in life, the faster you would want to go. You know, I think old people should be allowed to drive their age. If you're 80, do 80. If you're 100, go 100. And they can't see where they're going anyway, let them have a little fun out there. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down 